Hello and welcome to Enlightened Empaths, your community for the spiritually awakened. We hope your July is off to a great start and that you guys are enduring and thriving through this Mercury retrograde. I think we're doing okay so far, right, Denise? Yes, considering I think we're doing great. Yes, I do too. <laughs> So this week, it is our monthly community connection show, and we have so many great questions and stories to share with you guys. I hope we get through them all. If we don't, and you sent a question in, don't worry, we will just share them in our August community connection show. So would you like to start us off, Denise? Sure. Uh, this first question says, I hope you're having a great day. My mom and I have both had wonderful readings with you from you. This was for you, Samantha. We're big fans of psychic teachers and enlightened empaths. I have a question for the enlightened empaths that I believe may be relatable to other empaths out there. I'm a very cautious driver and a rule follower, yet experience frequent aggression towards me on the road. Honking, yelling, hand gestures, flailing arms at me in the window, all that. For example, I'll proceed on a green arrow and another driver going the other way will drive through and yell at me and give me the finger through the window, not realizing I was proceeding correctly. These things happen all the time for me and I feel scared and overwhelmed while I drive. One day it even made me feel a tightness in my throat. Later when I arrived home, my mom instantly knew I was off and feeling drained. I know I should let it go and realize that it's the other driver's anger and not me, but empaths may know how personal these things feel and how draining. What are things I can do to help this issue in my life? Like I said earlier, perhaps other people in this community have experienced this or things like this. Thank you for your time, your wonderful podcast, and all the work you do. Have a great day, Sophie. Okay. So first of all, we need to know, is Sophie driving in the middle of Boston? Because that's just part <laughs> of the deal if you drive in the middle of Boston. <laughs> And even all the years I've lived away, like I've lived all over the country, even now if I go into, I am like stupid aggressive if I drive in that city. So I'm sure she's not in Boston, but. No, she's not. But I know what you're saying. Whenever I drive up north to return home, the minute I hit over that Jersey line, my whole body posture changes. Oh, yeah. You go on red alert. Yeah. So I definitely understand what she's saying. I'm sure a lot of empaths listening to this show have experienced this. I have experienced this from a little different side. For years, whenever I was driving, someone would pull out in front of me, even though nobody else was on the road. They couldn't wait for me to pass and then decide to go, I don't know, 20 miles under the speed limit. Mm hmm and when I started realizing this was a pattern, and it sounds like for Sophie, this angry, aggressive driver, you know, coming at her is a pattern for her. Whenever that happens in our life, while it is frustrating and annoying to deal with, I believe it's the universe trying to wake us up and teach us a lesson to break a pattern. And I was able to break that pattern. It took a long time and it took a lot of focused prayer and really reflection on what was making me so mad. For me, now my situation is very different from Sophie's, but mine was control. I had to realize that I wasn't in control really when I'm driving or really ever, right? And he's like, you know, like you can't control other people. If someone's going to pull out in front of me, there's not a darn thing I can do about it. And so getting angry or upset or frustrated or impatient, it's only going to upset me. It's not going to help me or help the world in any way. And so I started changing up my energy. And when someone would do that, I would simply say, oh, well, this gives me an extra five minutes to get to work. I can finish listening to this podcast or finish my prayerful talk to my guides. And I just, even I faked it in the beginning. I really did, but it helped a lot. Now, I think with angry and aggressive drivers, it's a different energy you have to put out there. But before I let you talk about that, I just want to ask Sophie to look at the pattern. Like, is this happening in other areas of her life? Like for me, whenever I was around angry or aggressive people or just situations where I didn't have any control over how the other person was reacting, it would make me really upset. And when I surrendered that and recognized the pattern, it was really the first step to changing that anxious feeling when driving. That's wonderful advice. The other thing is that whatever vehicle we're driving in, it's an extension 
portion of our auric field. So if you're feeling aggression coming towards you in your vehicle, in your automobile, you extend your energy throughout the space of that car and or vehicle, whatever it is you're driving. And I think that it almost becomes more of a personal attack when there are aggressive drivers or people cutting you off or slowing you down. Because it's true, I'll react completely different when I'm in a vehicle versus when I'm, like if someone bumps into me in the store or cuts me off in the store, I might be a little, "Mm, why couldn't you say excuse me? But I don't feel as violated as I do if I'm cut off in an automobile, maybe because it's more dangerous in the car. Right. Uh, the, The other thing though that I've done because I do travel quite a bit in vehicles is I'll picture like a buffer zone around this very similar to how we put our protective energy around ourselves to go into big box stores or busy places or concert venues or whatever you can do that with your vehicle as well and another thing I have done occasionally when I'm feeling anxious in the car is I will literally visualize uh, like a guardian angel flying directly over my car, very protective over the, that makes sense, right? You, that yes. Vision. And I'll do that for my kids or people I love or people I know that are traveling long distances. I'll just visualize them in that safe space, but with angelic presence around them to help them get to where they're going safely. Yes. And, you know, I have a couple of stories, but I won't go into all of them because we don't have time. But when I was a little kid, I remember this one time we used to drive a lot for vacations and whatnot. And P.S., it was the 1970s, and my parents would smoke with the windows up because they didn't like highway noise. Uh Uh-huh. Do you remember those days? So my sister's like, like, like our sweater over our nose. But anyway, this one time, my sister, um, who was a bit of a worrywart as a kid, I think we all were, but she would always say, you know, angels protect us while we drive and get us safely to the beach or wherever we were going. And this one time she prayed that out loud and um, we all prayed with her and we weren't like a praying family. So it kind of stood out in my mind. And so we're driving and I'm, I'm on one of the window seats looking out the window and I kept seeing what looked like a white sheet hitting the side of the car. Ooh. And I kept saying to everybody, Oh my gosh, I, do we have like a blanket, a pillowcase? Like what, what's going on? And, Finally, my dad went to a rest stop and there was nothing there. And I really, I mean, I was little, I was like seven, eight or nine, but I really remember that. And I do think when she called on the angels, I do believe that they respond. And that was an image of one of their, I don't know, robes hitting the car or something as they flew alongside of us. Mm -hmm. Um, I've also told the story many, many times about pink light. And so I won't go into it here, but Really and truly, Sophie, if you just imagine pink light around you and your car, but more importantly, around all the cars you're going to interact in your day, that will soften anger tremendously. And finally, I would recommend that you put tiger's eye, black tourmaline, rose quartz, and or shungite in your car. Perfect. Okay, I'm going to read the next question. All righty. Hello, Samantha and Denise. You have both taught me more than I can express in one message. The recent show about anger and the empath left me feeling understood in a way I've never felt before. I am the one who says, you know what? It's my fault. I'm sorry. Here's a list of all the things that are wrong with me. Immediately after someone wrongs me, which then causes me to build even more resentment toward that person, and eventually I end up so deeply hurt and angry that I cut them out of my life forever and the person is left wondering what on earth happened. After listening to your show, I went from feeling isolated and crazy to completely understood. I was able to express to my boyfriend what that he had recently done to something to me that made me angry and why I felt angry. We were able to have an actual discussion about how I felt and he sincerely apologized and completely validated my anger. I feel like it was one of the first times in my life I didn't just use the, oh, it's my fault way out of conflict, so thank you. My question, however, is about obsessive divination. You briefly mentioned it in the ego versus intuition episode. I actually had to stop reading my own cards because it was becoming compulsive. I'd run home from lunch to read my cards quickly without a clear intention or question, and I would pull cards from about five different decks. It was very clearly a manifestation of my anxiety. I was in a toxic job and really wanted answers about the way out. Thankfully, I am out of that job now, and I actually didn't end up finding a way out until I stopped obsessively reading my cards. A beautiful new opportunity opened up 
once I put all my decks under my bed for a month or so. I would love to gain the self-control to be more mindful and intentional with my own readings for myself. It's certainly a challenge. Thanks again for everything you've taught me. Well, that's just a beautiful email. And, and I think we all understand that feeling of feeling anxious and caught and trapped in a job or a situation and just wanting someone or a card to say, everything's going to be okay. On April 3rd of this year, at this time, you will get a new job offer. You know, I think that's sometimes what we're looking for. And what she's expressing here is the gift of surrender. When she just surrendered to this worry and fear and put the cards under her bed, that's when everything started to unfold as it should. One of the things I do for myself is I only give myself a reading two times a year. I do it at Christmas time and then six months later at my birthday. I do look at other card decks, but I look at them for personal growth. So for example, there's a deck I really like called Return of Spirit by Cheryl Lee Harnish. It is not a predictive deck. It's a deck of like, you know, you should work on self-care today or you should work on drinking more water or that you should focus on a violet flame meditation today so it's not a predictive deck it's more of a self-growth deck and i like that to help guide my um, meditation intentions i have a, another card deck of hand mudras and i really enjoy that because it, it'll teach me like different mudras to hold and and try when i'm meditating uh, I have a Reiki deck that offers a different position to do Reiki on yourself. So I don't use card decks for predictions other than those two times a year. And so maybe it would help her if she put boundaries on herself with when she does this. I agree with that. And I do, I think we all, that's our natural inclination is when we, we want an answer, we want a direction, we want help is to look for, to look outside of ourselves rather than within. And I am. Um, so very guilty of the over divination at times and I'll catch myself now I pull a card I pull a medicine card in the morning for an animal of the day for myself and then I have uh, a couple other decks or oracle decks and I'll just choose one card for the day if I'm trying to make a decision about something I will you know highest and best what's the energy around this and I'll do a three card spread but not not every day but I do pull a card every morning just for kind of a, an overview of the day as far as doing full blown readings for myself I rarely if ever do that anymore because I found years ago that I would find what I wanted to see in the reading it's hard to have that objectivity that we need to have I also have um, a lot of people know I use the mother piece deck as my primary deck and I have one that ha I've had for so many decades and it's all paper thin and the pictures are about worn off and I would use that religiously but I found that it it mirrored what my inner self wanted the answer to be and then I would use a different deck and it would give me what was actually going on so just be careful that what you're connecting with with your own divination is it is it a wake-up call to what you're facing in your own inner world similar to what you were saying about the oracle decks that you that you're using or is it giving you an objective insight or more information about the situation, especially if you're asking about another person or situation that involves other people in your life? Great advice. And kudos to her for learning how to express her anger in a constructive, yeah. positive way. And I, I'm just honored that we were able to help her with that because I think that's one of the greatest challenges to learn how to do is to say, you upset me and here's why and I still love you but I need to share this and I'm just very very happy to read that that's awesome and that can be really scary I, I actually teared up a little bit when you were reading that yeah I know it, it's it is scary to have those confrontations and to share your vulnerable emotions with someone like that and I just think it's great that she was able to do that and I'm happy that we could be a part of that that's that's so why we do the show all right, let's take um, a quick two-minute break just to remind people of who we are and, and what we've got coming up, and then we'll get back into our questions. Perfect. You are listening to Enlightened Empaths with Samantha and Denise. We are very excited to tell you about our fall lineup of classes. Gosh, Denise, I sound like I'm introducing NBC's fall TV lineup. <laughs> <laughs> But seriously, we have some classes we wanted to share with you all. In August 
Thursday evenings from 7 to 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time, Denise and I will be offering our Mediumship 101 class. That's going to be Thursdays, August 8th, 15th, 22nd, and 29th. And if you want to learn more about that Mediumship 101 class, we will have a ton of information on our website, samanthafay.com and thegratefulmessenger.com. What we do in these classes is we introduce you to mediumship. We teach you how to open up, connect with your guides, work with the energetic vibration of lifting and connecting with the world of spirit. You are partnered up with someone new each week so you can practice what we're teaching you in real time. Each class is done over Zoom, so it's an we interactive webinar. You can see us, you can see everyone else and talk to each other and meet like-minded people. Each class is recorded, so if you can't make it one night or work runs late, it's no problem. Classes are recorded. They are emailed to you the very next morning. Do you want to say anything else about that class? We've had an amazing, amazing group of people. There's also a closed space group that you're able to join to practice and continue the, the relationships that you start with people in the class. And it is an international program, so you do meet people from around the country, around the world, which is really, really amazing. I do like that, that it builds that sense of community and people who are looking to practice can hop on that private Facebook page and connect with other people and say, hey, I want to practice that exercise we learned in week one again. Who's up for it? In September, we are offering that same class, but we're doing it during the daytime on Fridays. So that class is going to be September 6th, 13th, 20th, and 27th from noon to 1.30 p.m. Eastern time. So this was a good option for anyone who works from home or has a nice lunch break or anyone on the West Coast who can go to work a little late on Fridays or our international students. This might work out better for you all as well. So the Mediumship 101 classes for the fall are Thursday evenings in August and Fridays in September. And then in October, we're going to be offering our advanced mediumship class. And this is for anyone who has taken our Mediumship 101 class. And do you want to tell people what they can expect in that course? Well, we're able to build on the foundation that you learn in the Mediumship 101 class. We also, there are more practice exercises, there are more personal exercises, we explore topics with more depth, and we are able to help you develop your own connection with your strengths and weaknesses so that you can build upon those. We touch upon uh, animal communication. We touch upon medical intuition. We touch on, you know, cold cases. We really explore a lot of different aspects, different directions you can take your mediumship with. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful stepping stone if you're looking at starting a practice or honing your own skills or getting more self-confidence in your skills as a medium. Yeah, it helps you to really learn what type of medium you are, where you want to go with this. We talk more about the business aspects of this in that course as well. And once again, that's recorded on Zoom. And the class recordings are sent to you the very next day. You are partnered up each week. We have real-time practice during class in that course as well. So there's lots of exciting things you get with that class. And that's going to be October 3rd, 10th, 17th, and 24th, Thursday evenings from 7 to 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time. And we really hope that you join us for these classes. Denise and I have had so much fun teaching these classes and meeting our listeners and just watching the beautiful relationships that result from these classes and watching people really start to step into their light and build their connection to their gifts and the world of spirit. It's such an honor, really and truly, to teach these classes. I agree. And number one thing, it's a lot of fun. This will be the last time we'll be offering these courses in 2019. It will be after the first of the year into 2020 before we'll offer either of these, the 101 or the advanced class. So please go to either of our websites for more information and to see student feedback on those classes. Um, also, I wanted to let everyone know I have a new bracelet on my website store, which is Pray Night. Pray Night is called the Prophetess Stone. It's a wonderful stone to wear. 
if you are looking to increase your intuition. It's also called the Healer's Healing Stone because Pray Night helps to remind healers to make time for themselves, to nurture themselves, and to practice self-care. It's a wonderful heart chakra stone. And so lots more information about Pray Night can be found on the store part of my website. So we hope you guys check out what we are doing this summer and this fall. And we really hope to join that you join us in our mediumship classes this fall. All right, let's get back to the show. Samantha, have you ever asked permission to f- perform distance Reiki from a person's higher self and or guides and been told no? I had my first encounter with this today. I believe that sometimes this is part of a life plan the person established before coming here and therefore something they must do without outside help. Could this be the case? I was given permission to talk with this person's spouse about it and was told by the spouse that her husband has not fully come to terms with what's happened yet, but she's waiting for it to occur. Could it be that this is what's preventing me from helping him? I appreciate any insight you have with this. Thank you in advance for your time. Shelley. Yes, That has happened to me several times. When you are trying to perform distance Reiki on someone, what you do is you go into meditation and you ask that person's higher self, will you receive this healing? If you feel or hear or see the word no, you are to honor that, obviously. It doesn't happen a lot, but it will happen. And and the first time it happened to me, it was kind of shocking. Like, really? Who would say no to that? It's just nice, happy Reiki energy, but it does happen. And I think her feelings about this are spot on. He might just not be ready to receive this healing, or it might be a part of his karmic path to go through this for reasons we can't fully understand. Sometimes I think people's higher self say no to healing because that episode that they are enduring is a part of their soul growth. And I think that's one of the hardest things for a healer to really come to terms with is when someone either subconsciously or consciously rejects healing. But it's all a part of the process and we have to honor it. We have to just simply think of, think of yourself as, as a flashlight. You know, if, if you shine your light in a, in a dark corner, that dark corner can say no to that light and not want to be lit up. All we can do is keep turning and sharing and growing and sharing our light and hope that it's received where it's supposed to be received. But it's, I, I think that's a really hard one to deal with when you get that, no, but we have to honor it. And we can't it's, always understand why. Right. And especially because I think that Reiki energy work is such a connection to divine and such a healing energy. And to have a higher self or someone choose not to be a part of that. But I agree with everything that you said about it aligns with what we always say in readings. It's subject to change and free will. And, and I, you can't peek in people's psychic closets. You can't, I mean, it's, it's an honor thing. It's a, an ethics and an honor thing. So really pay attention to that. I agree with you a hundred percent. Well, our next question says, good afternoon. Thank you so much for doing a series on narcissism. It has been very helpful. When you talk about narcissistic partners, it is my understanding that there are differences between male and female narcissists. Can you please discuss the difference? Well, I did respond to this question in email personally, but what I said to her was, I don't think there is a difference. I know that most people think male narcissists are more overt and aggressive with their narcissism and female narcissists are more passive aggressive. But I, in my experience, I have seen it cross gender and I don't really think you can say all male narcissists do this or all female narcissists do that. There's many, many a male narcissist who is uh, what I have been told is called the martyred victim Mm -hmm. or the martyred narcissist where they kind of use that, oh, pity me as a way to engage their narcissism. And so I don't think we can assign gender to this. Do you? I agree. I agree with what you're saying. It, because it's similar to me of no matter who you choose to be with in a relationship, and I'm talking about a, a committed monogamous relationship with a partner person, it, 
I wish people would realize it doesn't matter who you choose or how you identify or what your gender preference is. It doesn't matter because you still have to go through all the same stuff in relationship. And to me, it's the same thing with narcissism. There are people who are wired that way and there are people who aren't. The nuances and, and it being similar to being on a spectrum. So I think that it's it, it may identify in different ways depending on the individual, not so much the gender. Yes. You know, I remember years ago when I was first married to Mike, who was a police officer for almost 20 years, he came home and had this pretty big gash on his head. And I said, whoa, looks like a tough day at work. And he told me they got a domestic violence call. And a lot of times you don't get a lot of information. You know, dispatch will just tell you, like, here's the address. We got a domestic call. So he goes in and, you know, furniture is everywhere. It's a chaotic scene. Uh, no one's around. And he finds this man hiding under the bed and he is battered. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he eventually found his, his wife out in the backyard. She was cooling off with a cigarette and a beer. And uh, she then attacked the police. And the story was so shocking to me. And he said, oh, no, no. Like, I say 30% of our domestic violence calls are women against men. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it happens. And it's not, so I just think we can't say like men are this way, females are this way. I, I really do think, especially as our consciousness elevates, we are starting to move beyond gender identification in, in a lot of ways. But narcissists, they cross all the lines and, and you'll have a passive aggressive male narcissist or an aggressive female narcissist. So you just got to be on alert for that. All yes. right. Do you want to read our next one? I'd love to. It says, hi, Denise and Samantha. I was going to see if you two could answer a question in your next Q&A. This is something I've been struggling with as an empath for such a long time. The po political state in America is very rough right now, and all the talk of cruelty being dealt towards people at the border is circulating heavily. As an empath, I found myself slipping into depressive states. I think it's worse because I have three young daughters, one of which is only six months old, and imagining my own babies in a place like that breaks me. I've been meditating, gardening, bonding with my crystals, and just trying to be positive, but I'm really, really struggling. Do you have any further advice for the spirit of people like us? Thank you again for all you do. I can't express how much your podcast saved my sanity with my PPD this last pregnancy. Um, I love that she's being proactive and taking care of herself and regrounding her energy and doing things that are um, bring us a, a sense of safety and security into her life. I also think that we're, um, and I, I say this a lot, and I truly believe it in my soul, anything that we can do to raise our own vibration and help someone else raise theirs is a key to breaking this darkness and polarity that's going on in the world right now. I okay. have a quick, quick, when my son was a baby, it was, uh, my oldest son was a baby. There was a, a case and uh, he was the same age as this baby who had been brought into an adoptive home. And then the biological parents came back and said, nope, we want our baby back. And I remember the raw fear and grief and anguish and heartache I felt at the thought of I would do anything humanly possible to protect my child and not let anyone come and take him. And I, so I have empathy and compassion for anyone, anyone who's trying to, to protect their babies. But I think that as an empath, we feel that so, so, so deeply and being very selective about not overdosing on media and, and news is vital right now. I agree. And I also think not engaging the opposing people. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I was at a yeah. social gathering and there were a couple of people there who were talking about this wall and they were in support of it. And it just, you know, was very interesting because I'm not saying I'm for or against the, I don't want to get into a political thing, no. but I just was saying to them, you know, how sad I felt at the way they were being treated and how, you know, these children didn't even have mattresses. They're just out in the heat in Texas and it's just a really bad situation. And, and this group of people didn't have a whole lot of sympathy for that. It's always like, um, like it just it's like punched in the gut. Like it's always such a shock. You know, I'm always so surprised that people don't really care. So I, I don't think I'm a very well-informed, educated debater. And what I have learned is you can't debate 
in this situation. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think, I think they kind of feed off that and enjoy it. So I would say, don't, don't engage in a debate. What has helped me and what has always helped me is trying to do something proactive so that I don't Mm -hmm. feel powerless. That's the worst thing when you see terrible things going on in the world. And so many times I just feel powerless, you know, like besides going to vote as an informed voter, what else can I do? And so some of the things that I have done, I created um, a crystal grid for children suffering and I just light a little candle on it. And I didn't do it for this situation. I, I, I just did it for all children because it started back when I read about the kids working in those factories, I'm sorry, in the, the cobalt mines in Africa. And so every time I look at my iPhone, I, I kind of feel guilty, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so she could start something like a crystal grid or just light a candle every day for uh, children. She could uh, donate to people politically who are supporting her views. And simply just saying a prayer, the, the power of a prayer, I can't tell you how far it goes. Read Larry Dossie's work if, if you think I'm saying that flippantly. Prayer has been proven to work. Read Betty Eady's old book, Embraced by the Light, where she talks about how prayers come to the other side, heaven, whatever you want to call it, as these giant beams of light. And a mother's prayers are the brightest lights that come across. And they are the first ones seen. And so I, I really do think if she just prays, and best advice of all is what you said, a media moratorium. The other uh, one little quick thing I'd like to add is that do something locally. And one of the things that really troubles me is that we are in a very abundant part of the world and we have children that are hungry. So I made it a real mission to work on food insecurity in my own community and with people that I could help. And that, I, in my, I believe this, it causes a ripple effect that is very, very far-reaching because a lot of the choices that we're making, I think, as individuals and as a country and as a world culture are based on grassroots movements of coming together as community. Yes, that is such excellent advice, Denise. In my community, I'm pretty sure it's national. We have that fill the backpack where mm-hmm. you know, so kids don't go home hungry. And you, most grocery stores, in my town anyway, you can drop off donations right there. So it's very easy. I know how hard it is with kids to do stuff like that. But a lot of these wonderful organizations are making it very easy to help out. And I just want a reminder... She's raising compassionate, empathic children. That alone is serving the world. Exactly. Our next question says, Dear Samantha and Denise, thank you so much for your podcast. It is a resource that has helped me immensely. Since I have started my internship, I have had this nagging desire to write you the following question. As of a few weeks ago, after I started my internship as a clinical mental health counselor in an agency that treats people with eating disorders, helping people with eating disorders is something I believe I was destined to do. As you may or may not know, this client population is exceptionally challenging. Many present with borderline personality disorder symptoms. They are fiercely intelligent, sensitive, observant, gifted, and strong. They are people who I believe, once healed, can make a monumental impact on the world. I know this because I was once in their position with my own eating disorder. I'm wondering if you can share any advice or practices for me to protect myself and clear any negative energy that may latch on to me while working with these clients. I understand that people with borderline personality disorder can be energy vampires as well as people with eating disorders. But my goal is to approach them with light, love, and curiosity rather than guardedness. I want to open myself to them, perhaps in ways that others never have before. Yes, many of these clients are challenging, but they are suffering too, often due to past trauma. How do you think I can go about sharing my light and love with my clients while also preserving and nourishing myself? Well, that is a beautiful question. Just the fact that she's asking it makes me think that she's already doing it. <laughs> That's exactly what I was thinking. It's exactly my words. I was going to say, you're already doing it, sweetie. Keep, keep lighting the torch and leading the way. Just the fact that she's seeing these people for who they're not, she's not seeing the disorder. She's seeing the intelligence, the sensitivity, the giftedness, the strength. Love, love, love this question. I do too. You know, when I worked with that challenging alternative high school, my first year of teaching, we had the last part of the day was group therapy. And we had a wonderful intern who was a, helping 
the, the counselor there. And he helped me so much. One of the things that he said is when the kids push back and react as they will do, don't react because that's why they're pushing back is they want to get a reaction out of you. So when they are negative or challenging or rude, just don't react, shrug it off. And when they are positive and kind and nurturing and helpful, then you react and you make a big deal about that. You know, kind of like the old adage, compliment publicly, criticize privately, you know, or reinforce the positive, de-emphasize the negative. That helped me a lot. Uh, I also think doing any psychic protection techniques is still going to be important in this environment because even if these people that she's helping are well-intentioned, that's a lot of chaotic energy flying through that building. So I would recommend that she always surround herself in white light and the pink light, take her shoes off uh, as soon as she comes home just to physically make that delineation of I am no longer at work, disconnecting from energy from work. I also think she should create a validation journal. Now, you and I all often recommend a validation journal for intuitive students so they remember when they got stuff right and they can start to build their confidence. But I think as an intern in this wonderful facility and work that she's embarking on, she should start a validation journal with that and write down when she was able to connect with a client, when she was able to get through a barrier of a wall someone was putting up so that when she does have difficult days, she can remind herself that she's doing really, really good work. And I'd recommend that she have a sage spray in her car and in her office. I'm sure she can't sage at work. That would be a little weird, <laughs> but she can make her own sage spray or get one um, and, and just spray so that she can, you know, clean and clear that energy within and around her as much as possible. I'd also recommend that she have strict work hours. And I don't mean that uh, literally, like only work eight to five. I mean, have strict work hours in her heart. I know you are the same as me, Denise. We carried a lot of our students home with us in our hearts. Mm -hmm. And I had to really learn how to shut that down and to just say, nope, they are staying at school. I am leaving them there. I need to focus on my family. And doing little things like taking my shoes off in the garage before walking in would remind me I'm leaving work outside of this home. It can also help to physically change your clothes. I remember when you were at, well, I'm old, so maybe not. It used to be you'd have play clothes. You'd come home, you'd take off your school clothes, you'd put on your play clothes, you'd go out yeah. and play. And I read this probably the last year I was in, in my teaching job is it said, come home and literally change your clothes into something that is signaling your brain, okay, I'm done with work. Now this is my time. And it really made a difference because I would get home and I'd be depleted and just be like, oh, I just want to sit in this chair and, and, and I would change my clothes. And then all of a sudden I'd have this new burst of energy and it would kind of mark the difference between my work life and my home life. Great advice. And, and yeah. also I just want to say the, one of the four agreements from that wonderful book of the same name is don't take anything personally. This has been my hardest agreement to work on, but every time I focus on that agreement, everything in my life goes better. If you try really hard not to take anything personally, even the good stuff. So let, like for me personally, let's say the client emails me and says, that was the best reading ever. You're amazing. You're so gifted. You're wonderful. Blah, blah, blah. I can't take that personally because it's, not really coming from me, it's coming through me. But I have to promise myself that the opposite will also be true. If someone emails me and goes, that was the most general, bland, blah reading, I can't take that personally either. That's hard. It's really hard. It's really hard. But at least focusing on it is incredibly helpful. And so I would recommend that she try that as well. So when she does break through to a patient, well... I actually do think she should take that personally, but I know I'm going against what I'm saying, but really she should try not to take that personally and just see it as just doing my job, ma'am, type thing, you know? Mm -hmm. But when she can't break through to a client, promise herself that she won't take that personally either. Perfect. Our next question is, Dear Samantha, I'm just listening to your podcast, Navigating Judgment, from May 14th. You are wondering about why you're personally hurt when someone judges you for working as a psychic, but when someone would judge curly hair negatively, it wouldn't bother you, although you're strongly identified with having big curly hair. I think the difference is that you didn't choose to have big curly hair. You were simply born with it, but you did choose your career as a psychic and a choice is always something that can be challenged. To me, it makes perfect sense that you wouldn't be bothered by the former, but feel bad about the, the latter. 
you know, I found you through the podcast Psychic Teachers, which led me to discovering enlightened empaths as well as Deb and Friends. And I'm so grateful for the myriad of topics you talk about and for sharing all of your knowledge and wisdom. Thank you so much for your podcast and all your work. The world needs your light, so please don't think you need to hide it. I'm grateful that you're so honest to share your difficulties with being a psychic because it makes you so much more authentic and real. Sometimes light workers have these overly positive vibes. They talk as if everything is awesome and love and light and that you can manifest anything anytime in your life. And if you have a bad day, just be the light. But let's be honest, it's just not that easy. Thank you for being so down to earth. Well, that's a lovely note. I know. And I just want to say, I did not put this in here to be like, look at me, everyone. I put this in here as a reminder to us all that when we are our authentic self, that's when we are best sharing our light. Because I have to tell you guys so many times when Denise or Deb and I hit stop record, how many times, Denise, have I said to you, I think you should edit that story I shared. (laughs) (laughs) Right? Because... It's so scary to share who you really are. Vulnerable. Yeah. And so I just really loved this email and I thanked her so much for it because of two things. One, it's a reminder that it's okay for me to share my fears and insecurities on this show. But also, I never thought at all the way she made me think in that email because I have never looked at being a psychic medium as a choice. The way it unfolded for me, it did not feel like a choice. It Mm -hmm. really didn't. The way it just happened and the work just kind of fell into my lap, I I never looked at it as a choice. But when I read her email, I thought, no, you did make that choice. You chose to walk away from teaching English. You chose to set up an office. I, I did make that choice. And it was just really interesting to think, yeah, I I did choose this. Holy shit, I did choose this. Yes. <laughs> There's a tip with this once you realize it's a choice. I know. But then, though, to, to validate that for you is if you're intrinsically wired in, to be very psychic or very intuitive, it's just who you are. So making, yes, you choose to be more public with it, but it's also more or less just showing your true self to the world. Yes, exactly. And so I hope this just serves as a reminder to everyone that it really is okay to share the truth of who you are. I first learned it back in the 80s. Oh, I have to say, on June 26, my dad celebrated 37 years of sobriety. Wow. I think I have to do the math again. I don't know. A long time. But when he was going through the AA motions and all that first year, he built it into my head. One of the AA mantras is, you're only as sick as your secrets. Mm -hmm. And he used to always say, because my mom would tell us all, don't tell anybody your dad is an AA. They'll judge you. They'll think he walks around in a wife beater tank top and is a terrible man and, and he's a good person. And, you know, so my sisters would never tell anyone that dad was an AA because my dad was a really nice or is a really nice guy, but he, he would get even nicer when he drank. So we, you know, it wasn't like the typical angry drunk that people think of. So they felt some shame about sharing that. But my dad would always say to me, I'm proud of being an AA. I am proud that I took this step. I'm proud that I choose every day not to drink. And so I told everybody, I was so proud of my dad. And I would celebrate June 26 more than his birthday because I, it was, you know, so it taught me through sharing that with friends and seeing that I wasn't judged, that my dad wasn't judged, that people were like, that's awesome. That's great. I, you know, blah, blah. It taught me that it really is okay to share those sides of yourself that maybe you've been taught not to share or that have been ingrained in you. Oh, people will judge you for this. And so ever since I've been kind of an open book, but I do, I do still struggle with how much of an open book I am. So it's nice to have emails like that. Yeah, you know, it was a and, and very well deserved as well. Oh, very, right very back at well. you. Well, we have about twelve more questions to go, and we are out of time. <laughs> <laughs> so we will uh, save all of these, and we will share them in our August community connections. Because I'm just scrolling through; we've got so many great questions, but I promise we will get to them. Um, And in the meantime, we hope that you guys have a really happy, safe, constructive, and restful 
rest of July because this is a doozy of a month. But hopefully from our astrology show, you learned that there's so many positives about the different energy going on this month. I am choosing to take this Mercury retrograde and all those other planets we talked about that are in retrograde as an excuse to kind of tune out a little bit more than I normally do and try to rest and take some time to myself more than I normally would. And and I hope everyone can do the same and really use this month to rest and recharge and just do something fun. So have a great week. We will be back with you next Monday. As always, don't forget to show up, do great work, share your light. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.